rights for Saturday Night Live. And we'll be seeing samples of both of their works uh, a bit later. Oh, there are your names on the screen, fellas, in case you All right. in case you have any problem with that. Uh, oh, I, I, I failed to hold up the book. Yes, there he is, The Late Night with David Letterman, book of top ten lists, and it even comes complete with ten reasons you should have it. There, there now. Did that help? I hope it did. Oh, yeah, I'm it happy. Helped. It all helped. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's make this a, an earnest seminar on the subject of comedy and see if we can put, put the viewers. Yeah, it was to always work, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, was, I think that aside from love, comedy is the deadliest subject you can be serious about. So we, we'll try not to be too much. But um, the difference between the two shows seems to strike me a bit. Uh, w one aspect of it that doesn't get dwelt on that much is the lifestyle of working on them is supposed to be very different. The image outside yeah. is that the Saturday Night Live people live a life of parties and boisterousness and paper oh, yes. hats and uh, <laughs> very late hours. We're famous for our paper drives, and, of course, and the, uh, uh -huh. the big community breakfasts we have. <laughs> and, and, well, that sort of completes And that the Letterman people live a, a more bourgeois bankers sort of existence well yeah sort of have to we're, may, we're maybe more like a newspaper where they're a, a slick glossy magazine yeah. or at least a weekly is that what it is all right they're yeah. like they're like the sunday parade and uh, right right and we're like the daily news yeah i think that, that pretty well spells it out um the hours are vastly different right you'd, you'd have to change your entire biology to move from one show to the other well Probably. yeah you could more or less say that i'll i'll, I'll see com uh, conan coming into the building while i'm i'm leaving yeah. Has anyone pointed out that the two of you each come, that both of you comes, do you know what I mean, that in each case you we, come we from... We rode a car here together, if that's yeah, what that, you mean. Uh, yeah. We have that in common. C comes from Harvard. Um, yeah. Now, there's nothing yeah. to be ashamed of, and I don't want to rub it in and... No, that, no, uh, no, that, that, comes, that comes up a lot. It seems to come up more and more uh, since the early 1980s when you started seeing Harvard graduates, and especially uh, uh, men and women who are on the Harvard Lampoon, the... Yeah. Humor magazine, an organization on campus, uh, writing, uh, writing uh, TV and uh, for magazines and so on. Yeah. I, it, it seems to be a surprise to a lot of people because I think still the classic popular notion of Harvard graduates isn't knee slapping and funny, but rather kind of maybe dull and wan and pale I and know. annoying. And the idea of mom, I've decided to go to Harvard and, and uh, write gags for pantaloons and comics. And it's become <laughs> like, it's, yeah, not, with your shoulders bare on stage. It's become, it really has become like more of a respectable occupation, I think. I think if you yeah. had said in the 60s, if you had come out of Harvard in 1965 and said, I'm going to write for TV, that uh, you'd be seen as some sort of failure. Mm -hmm. But now it's definitely, you get more people, I think, now you're seeing people at Harvard who are thinking, you know, uh, you know, uh, maybe TV is a good career for me. They probably, you couldn't have found anybody who was thinking that years, not that many years ago at Harvard, I'm sure. Uh, mm -hmm. But we don't open the catalog and see um, a survey course of comedy from Aristophanes to Roseanne. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I wouldn't put it past. <laughs> yeah, you know, it seems right about now. now. I, 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 I think when I was in, in, at school in the mid-70s, I don't think it was a, a viable career option quite then yet. But I think now people, I talk with undergraduates and they say, well, I'm, I'm writing some scripts, I'm going to send them out right. to, you know, Viacom or, <laughs> or, or, or Fox or something yeah. like that. And it seems like they, they accept as a matter of course that this is a profession like dentistry or lawyering right. or and by the State time, Department. So. By the time I graduated Harvard, which was 1985, I got a call. I got two agents calling me you know, while I was writing my thesis, you know, which... You mean they're scouting Harvard now? The I way think they are. I mean, I think there's a little bit of that now because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, which is, you know, maybe, uh, maybe somehow perverted, but, uh, yeah, I got calls from people. They were unsolicited. They were just like, they had heard the, you know, let's call the Lampoon Castle, give it a shot, see invest ten minutes in a phone call and see what idiot answers, you know. One of the guys might pan out. Right. For so. Us. But what, let me look at an example of each of your work. I'm having trouble with my pronouns here. Uh, here, uh, let's start with uh, a clip from SNL, Saturday Night Live. <laughs> let's, uh, this is a thrill to see your work come alive. Uh, that cracks me up every time I see it. <laughs> let's do it again. <laughs> Want to run it back? And, uh, get Please, a, could get we? <laughs> I've got time. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the genesis of that, was that, a, was that ordered... Uh, that was just, well, that was, uh, I went to, uh, I think I, I, I was out on the street with 
another writer on the show, Robert Smigel. Yeah. And um, it was just something a girl went by, and uh, yeah. I, I think it started when I started. I was acting like an idiot, and I just watched a girl go by, and I said, you know, hello and goodbye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's not interested in me at all. And uh, he started doing it, and we both had fun doing it. So uh, we thought we'll give it a try. And then Tom Hanks, you know, was great doing it. A lot of it's just matching it to the host. Yeah. If a host yeah. can do it, you know. If Hey, are there hosts who come in with a good list of things that it, please don't ask me to do this or that or yeah there are I mean if a host is just been involved that they want to be asked to do crazy stuff that you'd rather they didn't and it's it's funny sometimes you get a host who is on the show only because they've been involved in some huge scandal you well, know yeah. they've just committed a murder or something and that's the reason they're on the show mm -hmm. and they come in the first day there they say look nothing about that <laughs> you know, and that's always, you know, someone who would never, uh, never be on right. anyway. But mm -hmm. in general, they're, I'm surprised by how good a sense of humor most hosts have about, yeah. you know. Can you think of anybody who f refused to do something just because that didn't fit his image or hers? Yeah, well, I, I remember uh, I worked on a sketch, this, you know, I worked on a sketch and uh, with, with George Steinbrenner, and I think there was one thing in it where he had to do something really silly that he, you know, like dance or something. And he was like, I don't really want to, you know, I don't want to be seen dancing. And, you know, you can understand so we, that. Some people have. We were deprived of the Steinbrenner terpsichore, eh? Yeah, and yet we got to see uh, the president's son, Ron Reagan uh, uh, Jr., dancing around in his BVDs. Yeah, we everyone has a... BVDs, right? Well, they, they probably know. were from wardrobe. Could, could have been. Yeah. They were BVDs. They were so yeah, We Chris, checked yeah. on that. <laughs> That's right. That goes back some years. Yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, Steinbrenner wouldn't do that. No, I, I mean, that, that's, uh, I think he was just made it clear, you know, he was uncomfortable and, uh, you know, he was a good sport about a lot of things on that show, actually. I think he was wearing, he wore a bra, actually, a, a, a stuffed bra. Uh, <laughs> that's a and, sign of flexibility. <laughs> yeah, so it's strange that you do get hosts that say things like, you know, I'm not going to, uh, you know, please don't make me wear a bathing suit, right. but then they're really happy to be greased up and... You know, you, yeah. shot through a can. You're not something. revealing some secret about Steinbrenner that you caught. This is part of the show that you're discussing. He wanted to be greased up. That's, I'm just really <laughs> for the cast part. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I read something to that effect, but I guess I, guess I, I wasn't ready for it. Uh, we can take another example now. This time, a bit of comedy from the David Letterman show. I appreciate you dropping Thank you very much. Now, you remember what I said way back in 1982? Mm, when we first went on the air... In 1982, right. I said that if your show lasted eight years, I would eat a thousand cocktail wieners in one minute. <laughs> and I am my word, that's a stopwatch. Let's do it. Come really? on. Now, Tom, you're serious. You don't I'm have to... lose your 1,000 cocktail wieners. All right, here we go. Ready? Yes. Set. Go. One, two, go, go. three... Late Night with David Letterman, 8th Anniversary Special, will return in a moment. Here with an important update is Bob Jameson from NBC in New York. Good evening. The local, national, and international situations are essentially unchanged since the news broadcast earlier this evening. Repeat, the world situation is stable. There have been no major developments. Word of serious or unusual breakthroughs would certainly have reached NBC News by now, but no such word has been received. Sources within the State Department, the Pentagon, and the Franklin Mint confirm that everything is pretty much the way it was before. Again, NBC News has established that nothing much is up, everything is okay, or at least it's about the same as it was an hour ago. This is Bob Jamison in New York. We now return to David Letterman's 8th anniversary special, already in progress. 998, 999, 1,000, all right, 58 <laughs> Well, this is all part of the Tom Hanks tribute month that's going yeah, on. Yeah, I just realized that, uh, right. Well, comments. actually, we only work with Hanks. Apparently, Tom we, Hanks supports most of comedy in America. Yeah, he's the, he's the workhorse. <laughs> two pieces from random, both with Tom Hanks. Nothing has changed. We'll be back right after this, if not during it. Talking with two writers from, uh, well, one each, that is, from Saturday Night Live and from uh, David Letterman, and I'm going to assume you didn't just join us, or just join us in this country and not know what those shows are, so we'll move right along. Uh, so, uh, uh, the Saturday Night Live atmosphere has changed since the old days, I gather, um, of Belushi and so on. Is it still yeah. legendary there? Or are there old timers who say, I survived it? Yeah, I mean, there's people there who were there in 75. And, uh, you know, obviously that was probably more of a, in, you know, intense 
experience than the one I've had. I've yeah. been at Sound Out Live for three years, and I think if you were there in the, you know, from 75 to 80, you obviously were probably living through, you know, it was such a happening then. Yeah, I th do you think it was any easier to write for it then when you had all of the, um, it, it was kind of going against the culture, it had a sort of definition. I just think maybe it was more, Saturday Night Live was, uh, it, it was more of an event then, and mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of the, I think the writing was great then, but I've heard people who were there at the time say that now it's a little harder because there's been such a comedy boom, there's been so much, so much has been commented on that now, uh, you have to work a little harder to find something that's, you know, new or interesting. Yeah. So, uh, also, uh, w uh, did Lorne Michaels, was he quoted somewhere as saying, or was it perhaps to one of you, that <laughs> on the Letterman show, now you can kind of wink at the camera, but we have to hit a, you know, really connect with the ball each oh, time. Yeah. No, he's, I've, uh, I've, I've met Lorne uh, Michaels. Leading to the idea that yeah. it's uh, somehow <laughs> easier to he, write. No, he those. mentions that every time I've met him about oh, taking a full swing at the ball, and he's, he's right. I mean, we can goof around. Again, it's that, it's that right. daily throwaway quality like a paper, but they've got to take a full swing at the ball. They set themselves up and say, here's our premise. Right. Now mm -hmm. here it is for your formal consideration. Hope yeah. you like it. And then if when it yeah, happens, when the, when the joke of the whole 10-minute sketch, which you've worked all week on, is revealed in the first minute and the audience doesn't like it, the machine has <laughs> mm -hmm. to just keep rolling, and that's, uh, that's often humiliating. <laughs> Have you noticed that if you go down the hall and bury your head and there's something where you can't hear the lack of laughter, it helps at times like that? Well, actually, the thing that you do most commonly is when your sketch is really falling apart is you stand there and watch the monitor and laugh like, ah, it's dying, I find this amusing too, and then you go <laughs> home and, you know, weep bitterly. Yeah. So. Wishing you were anywhere else, including the Titanic. Probably. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now, when, when, does Letterman ever get annoyed at, at the writers and, and come out and say, God's no, wounds, no, these alleged scribes no, have not handed me anything in the humor vein in a fortnight? I know no, no, how I would he say talks. He, he, no, well, it very much like that, the yeah. quatrains. Uh, <laughs> no, he ha, ha, would never do that, uh, but he would be extremely picky and fussy beforehand. I mean, we, he, he, the turndown rate is very the high. The selectivity yeah. is... Yeah, so once he's picked something, he's, he must think at least enough of it to give it a shot, and if it yeah. doesn't go, he's not going to storm off and you know, crumple up the blue cards and... Uh, He's been around long enough to know it doesn't pay to berate the writer. We didn't see, I, I, I can't imagine him in a, in a rage of that kind anyway. No, I would say he probably appears as crankiest right on the air, complaining about the... <laughs> Save it for the air. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But do you happen to know of his, why he has a particular knowledge of buttons? He, he seems to... Uh, you mean like... Uh, like uh, shirt buttons. Shirt buttons? Uh, well, of course, his, 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 uh, his London tailor on Savio Row. Uh, no, I actually, I've never heard that before. I know he has a vast knowledge of a lot of stuff, whether it's to. shock absorbers or, uh, yeah. or, or you, know, uh, uh, you know, names of Canadian provinces. He seems to, he seems to have a, a wide-ranging knowledge in general, which makes him good to work with because yeah. he, he'll, he'll know what you're talking about or better than, than you do. Well, that, that confirms something then. It also gives me a theory because I, I once showed him around New Orleans and he was amazed at my, apparently, my, what he thought was my esoteric knowledge of New Orleans, but I had been there before and knew a bit about it. So maybe that's why he made a point. See, I wore this shirt in case he saw this show oh, okay. because I wore it up to his office one day and he said, that's a uh, Banana Republic shirt, I think, oh. isn't it? See, I said, you, you know how I know? The buttons. I went, oh, right, of course. And, this has puzzled me ever since. Well, I think it's simple. I think he's just uh, observant and has a good memory and is pretty smart, but... He didn't want to just be competitive, because I knew New Orleans, he showed he knew buttons. Plus, well, he likes to wear his button knowledge on his sleeve. <laughs> uh, I think you've handled yourself perfectly on this absurd subject that I brought up. If I, <laughs> if I were your you. employer, I would give you a, ra a raise. Uh, could you guys each change jobs, you think, without any major adjustments? Uh, do you see them as oh, a one-way? Oh, I, I know Conan could do mine, uh, just because, I mean, he's already got the sort of yeah. the, the, the more more uh, structure and so on. I mean, we're, we're less writers, I think, on the Letterman show than just sort of uh, idea persons. I mean, yeah. Dave's, uh, Dave Letterman's strengths, I think, are being spontaneous and responding to things. So our, our mm -hmm. job is more giving him things to do where he can improvise and be, be himself and, and react to stuff. Um, I'd have trouble, you know, with... Uh, just just knuckling down to do characters and plot and oh you could do it wow it's easy <laughs> <laughs> all right we'll make hey, a bet right here fifty right bucks here. I say you, right. know, you switch jobs you could test this just for fun you would no one would have to know you could 
borrow each other's typewriters if they're known to your employers and just try They'd catch see, on. See what happens. They're pretty sharp. <laughs> what, if, what if one of you got the other one canned? That would not be nice. Yeah. I uh, think I saw that on the Flintstones, though, once where... Uh, it's not a bad idea for a sitcom. I'm Barney to his Fred. Yeah. Uh, that's right, or, or Wilma goes down to the shale pit and... <laughs> Fred tries, you know, vacuuming right. with the mastodon or whatever. I think the house is always filled with bubbles at the end. <laughs> it's always it's ends a good that rule way. of <laughs> If we anyway, switch jobs, this studio will be filled with bubbles. I don't know why. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's how it's going to work out. By the way, years ago, and I think it, even today, when they can't think of an ending for a sketch, everyone yells and throws food at each other or something. The rave-off. Like the, the, the number that, 11. Is that oh, called the rave-off? <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Well, that's what, you know, yeah. If yeah. you ever can't think of an ending for a sketch, it's always good to either have someone jump out a window and have someone else give one of those big reactions, which I do in every other sketch I write, or, uh, you know, have a big fight break out. <laughs> yeah, the plunge to the plate glass. <laughs> we, we can always have Paul Schaefer do a little song. That kind yeah. of seems mm -hmm. to wrap things up, and that's good night, everybody. Drive safely. Music's your best friend at a time like that. Quit, um, I wouldn't want to put you on the spot in any way, but who's been the worst schmuck you've had as a guest on Saturday Night Live? Oh, man. I don't know if I'm, I mean, I don't know if contractually or legally <laughs> what I can say. Um, <laughs> I can't, I don't think I can say, because whoever, I, I, I have I someone in. I there's a clear winner, though. Yes, the there's a clear winner since oh. I've been there. But I, if I say, I know they're going to want this person back, you know. Oh, if that's I say, true, um, well, then we, I know why, he's watching now. Huh? Why play, oh, we know it's a male. <laughs> that pretty much narrows it down. Uh, uh, I think we all know who it is now. Everyone's yes. Thinking, oh, Linda Ronstadt, <laughs> off yeah. the hook. Whew. All right. Don Knotts did the show, and he was just, no. He, we don't mean Don Knotts. <laughs> if, let, just, uh, I'll tell you what. No, if I, if I promise to tell viewers who write in, if you tell me afterwards, I'll I'd, tell be a, you, I'd be a fool. So I'm not going to make that promise. I'll tell you afterwards, and if anyone writes in now, you know, you will, you, will, you will supply them with the answer. If you can prove that it's postmarked during this show. All right. It's a deal. Well, okay. It'll be in the, the show's newsletter anyway. <laughs> Open. Well, let's, we better change the subject. Open this to any top ten list, and I'll sight-read it and see if I can make either of you laugh. Uh, okay. Uh, why am I doing this? Well, I don't even have uh, glasses uh, or uh, maybe... Top ten names for the reunited Germany? Yeah. Anybody got a pair of glasses? It's pretty no. big time. Wait a minute, I bet I do. You can try, okay. but I'm not the laughing. Top, the top ten, uh, what names? Uh, new names for new the United, United, United Germany. New names for the United Germany. I, of course, start with ten. Uh, ten, right I, down to one. Because I've seen the show. W one of them is, uh, number ten, Kegerland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just plain Volks. Siegfried and Roy. Seven, Aryan Acres. <laughs> Six, Argentina East. I love that. Five, The Love Shack. <laughs> Four, Nazi Chusets. Three... <laughs> Switzerland's badass neighbor to home of Das Whopper and number one, Cindy. Oh, that was nice. That's not bad. Try another one. I think it's not the one. same without the drum roll. I know you got to have a drum roll. And perhaps uh, a song from Paul. And Paul. Uh, uh, well, how about some uh, luncheon meats? <coughs> okay, top ten least popular Oscar Mayer lunch meats are number ten, pulled hamstring, number nine, grisalami, number eight, smoked Schwarzenegger, seven. Gee, your ham smells terrific. Six, <laughs> Ava Braunschweiger. Five, San Diego chicken roll. Four, Joseph Bologna. Three, Smoky Pittsburgh Senorita, aimed at Hispanic women smokers who live in the Pittsburgh area. Little and market research. Hey, those aren't pimentos. And number one, Hoffaloni. Tremendous. I, I find things like the ones where people's feelings can be hurt the funniest. <laughs> well, yeah, I think we've heard a few feelings. But we've gotten some nice response from people, like Ralph Nader has, you know, we, has, we did a, a list of, uh, you know, top ten ch uh, ways American cars would be different if Nader had never been born, and there were uh -huh. things like, you know, piano, wi piano wire seat belts and in-dashboard hibachi and that kind of stuff. And he wrote a note and said he wanted a copy of the list, and that was sort of nice. So That was nice. Too. Some people like him. There was, uh, what was the, uh, the one that killed me is the uh, punchlines of, Favorite, uh, favorite Scottish jokes, oh, that, I think. Oh, that is absolutely one of my As favorites, in, yeah, but a, it was just... That's not a bagpipe, but keep playing it anyway, and <laughs> other things that just, you know... That's right. I couldn't imagine what the jokes that's could right. possibly Oh, the be. other one was, uh, another one was, uh, oh, you mean you can get wool off them, too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, th wait a minute, it's being gotten around the oh, studio yeah, as, oh. as we sit here. It's been a quiet studio audience, but <laughs> yeah. they're loosening up now. So, when you guys get fully grown up, do you see yourselves as still writers, uh, or will you break through having succumbed, or well, one of you performs mm. 
Well, there's no stranger to the limelight, I know. Well, you perform on the... On, we, 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 yeah, I guess I we both dabble. Yeah. It's a marginal <laughs> performing. Yeah. But it's not a stepping stone yet to... You have a few minutes to think about this when we come back. You're watching CNBC. Gentlemen, as young fellows, I mean, even younger than you are now, what TV did you grow up on? Oh, well, uh, I remember really, I, I watched a lot of uh, SCTV in the late, you know, mid to late 70s, which is yeah. around the time that I was in grade school and high school. Um, when I was younger, I loved Get Smart. I thought that was a great show. That, uh, you know, that was a show that really made me laugh when I was a kid. And that, that, that's among your early TV memories? Yeah, yeah, well, I guess, you know, the, the, the earliest memories, I guess that, that was when I was starting to become aware of, you know, comedy. And, and uh, I remember watching, you know, uh, Get Smart and thinking it was hilarious. Before that, it was all, you know, Dean Martin specials and things like that, <laughs> which I didn't understand. But <laughs> they're they're complex. <laughs> yeah, they're very, you lots of complex riddles in there. They're so. published now with footnotes for those. Yeah, well. you, did, did, you, uh, did you pick yourself writing, though, then, or was that way off? I remember, you know, around the time I was watching SCTV and, and really falling in love with it, I, I remember thinking, this is something I'd like to do, you know. Uh, we would get the, uh, the ones with the old Indian head logo, uh, which were, I think they were like, you know, the, the bad reception. I remember mm -hmm. I used to, we used to stay up late and watch them. And, uh, you know, I, I would watch Saturday Night Live too, but I remember feeling more uh, excited about SCTV. I thought that that was, it was so odd. It was so different. And that, funny. I mean, yeah, it was really great. And I remember thinking, that's sort of when I started to think, yeah, maybe there's something, you know, how does one do that? Where can I do this? Where do I sign, yeah. you know? There is the common feeling that, Writing is just a job with a built-in frustration that suddenly hits you. Hell, I could go out and get those laughs, too. Why am I giving this away? Mm -hmm. I can honestly say I don't remember feeling that writing for people I wrote for, Carson or, or others. I, right. I guess I, at the time you're so tickled that your stuff gets used and said by well, famous people true enough. in their voice that you... Well, also, it's not like uh, I would write something for Dana Carvey or Phil Hartman, you know, who are... Uh, mm -hmm. and, and have them do it and you know I just never sit on the sidelines and say I could do a better you know yeah, than Dana I because you know I, I think that feeling comes a lot out of when you see people who you feel you know if, if you feel you could do it better yeah. then I think that's that's when that frustration really kicks in but I don't feel that at the show I, I mean, don't know if this is universal do, do you know writers like yourself well see do, do you want to are you really no, not really. I, I, I feel the satisfaction is in the writing and putting it together. I mean, yeah. we get to do small bits on the show just because we throw everything together at the last minute and usually cast from our own uh, office and studio crew. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I mean, we've had a writer or two who were natural performers and took to it, uh, you know, uh, quickly and adeptly, like Chris Elliott, who has his own show that's very funny on Fox. Uh, yeah, Elliott. But I don't think that's really true of the rest of us. Right. Maybe because maybe some have done... Uh, uh, some stand up here and there and you know suffered mm -hmm. enough to kind of know well maybe we're it, we look too much like writers standing up there talking it's not the, <coughs> not quite solid or confident enough uh, no writing is the is is the happiness for me are you going to stand on your constitutional rights as David Lloyd has done not to be made a producer once you're a successful comedy writer uh, I think he examined the constitution and found that you don't have to become a producer if you don't want to wow it seems like some people sort of want to though maybe that's just again it's a uh, uh, yeah. uh, role playing you can't just keep getting the same title you can't remain a lieutenant forever true get those oak clusters or whatever they are yeah well you Sometimes we have to resist temptations. Well, my, my plan is to become an alcoholic prep school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, th thank you both for being here. We're nearly yeah. out of time, and I, I want to thank you both for being not only so splendid and so good in your jobs, but revealing to me that you can get wool from them as well, uh, however it's worded. We'll see you next time.